chapter 2. Starting in the first verse. First. <laughs> chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Before we get started this morning, do our spiritual breathing this morning, our little exercise we do every Sunday morning. I want you to breathe out. Let all that junk you might have brought in here, all that stuff that might be keeping God from ministering to you this morning, just let that stuff go this morning. Ask God to clear your heart, to clear your mind. Let Him minister to you this morning. It's not going to be what I preach. It's not going to be what I say. It's going to be the Word of God that convicts you and that ministers to you here this morning. Allow God to do that this morning. As you breathe back in, ask God to fill you with that perfect Holy Spirit of His and let you be ministered to this morning. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. Most people know this story. Most people's heard it over and over. It's the Christmas story, what we call the Christmas story, the most in-depth account we have of the birth of Jesus is found here in Luke. Luke chapter 2, it says, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar, Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no, no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings and great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word, Lord. Father, thank you for that little baby that was born in that manger so many years ago, Lord, that come to bring salvation to the world, Lord. We thank you for that. Father, I pray this morning that I can decrease, you will increase, Lord, that you'll hide me behind that cross. Father, I pray your spirit go out before me, preparing the hearts, preparing the minds for each and every person here this morning, Lord. And Father, again, I pray that you just bind Satan and loose your, little, your group, Loose your spirit on this little group of people whom you love. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me ask a question this morning. What do you think of when you think of Christmas? Do we think of Black Friday sales? Do we think of shopping? Do we think of snowmen? I mean, we don't have many of them in Florida, but they tend to be a, a big thing. Sarah recently asked me, she said, Daddy, how come do I see penguins everywhere? What does a penguin have to do with Christmas? how to answer that. I don't know what a penguin does have to do with Christmas. Other than they come from cold, a place that's cold. Christmas in Florida though, penguins, I don't know. That penguin needs to be wearing a bathing suit. But what do we think of when we think of Christmas? Think about that for a little bit. You know, we think of sales, we think of Christmas shopping, we think of Santa Claus, we think of all these things. You know, and there's so much out there that kind of that kind of shadows over what Christmas is all, really all about. I mean, there's so much, and, and we are just as guilty as anybody else. We get caught up in it. I, I'm not going to stand up here and condemn anybody because Cheryl and I get caught up in it. You know, we, we try to make sure our kids have a good Christmas in our kids. There, There's just so much when we think of Christmas that kind of overshadows what Christmas is really all about. <clears throat> My research, I come across some interesting facts about Christmas. Most of Santa's reindeer have male sounding names, such as Blitz and Comet and Cupid. However, male reindeer shed their antlers around Christmas, so the reindeer pulling Santa's sleigh are likely not male, but female or castrated deer. That would explain why they never get lost. 
Because they will stop and ask for directions. Where are we going? In AD 350, Pope Julius I, Bishop of Rome, proclaimed December the 25th the official celebration date for the birth of Christ. Now, notice he put it December the 25th, the official celebration date. He never said that was Jesus' birthday. You know, this is one of the things that we hear all the time, one of them controversies. Well, what are you doing celebrating in December anyway? That's probably not Jesus' birthday. And, and it's probably not. You know, we don't know. The Bible don't tell us when Jesus' birthday. Most scholars think it was probably spring, somewhere around there. We're not celebrating. <clears throat> We're not celebrating the actual day of his birth. We're just, we've chosen a day to celebrate Jesus' birthday. We have picked a day out of the year. Some people say the reason it was December the 25th is to, because there was a big pagan celebration of the winter sauces going on, and the Christians wanted something to kind of try to overshadow that and make that not as, as noticeable. <clears throat> According to data analyzed from Facebook posts, two weeks before Christmas is one, of the, is one of the two most popular times for couples to break up. However, Christmas Day is the least favorite day for breakups. So if you made it past this last Friday, you're probably good until after Christmas without your spouse leaving you. So, uh, I didn't share that with Cheryl because I was scared she might take off last Friday. <laughs> point. But, uh, this fact I found, and I just thought of Tennille the whole time. When I seen this, I said, i got to include this because this is Tennille. In Poland, spiders or spider webs are common Christmas tree decorations because according to legend, a spider wove a blanket for baby Jesus. In fact, Polish people consider spiders to be symbols of goodness and prosperity at Christmas. <laughs> kind of explains why their Polacks have that reputation. No? <laughs> Alabama was the first state in the United States to officially recognize Christmas in 1836. Christmas wasn't declared an official holiday in the United States until June the 26th, 1870. Oklahoma was the last U.S. state to declare Christmas a legal holiday in 1907. Florida established Christmas as a holiday in 1881. Christmas stockings. Y'all ever wondered where Christmas stockings, how that could have come about? Christmas stockings allegedly evolved from three sisters who were too poor to afford a mar marriage dowry and were therefore doomed to a life of prostitution. They were saved, however, when the wealthy bishop, St. Nicholas of Smyrna, the precursor to Santa Claus, crept down their chimney and generously filled their stockings with gold coins. <clears throat> there are two competing claims as to which president was the first to place a Christmas tree in the White House. Some scholars say Fr President Franklin Pierce did in 1856 Others say that Pre President Benjamin Harrison brought in the first tree in 1889. <coughs> President Coolidge started the White House lighting ceremony in 1923. President Teddy Roosevelt, an environmentalist, banned Christmas trees from the White House in 1901. <clears throat> and so just some things I thought were interesting facts and some things that kind of show us. You know, what do we think about when we think of Christmas? A lot of that had to do... With, with Christmas trees and stuff like that. I read one fact that said the first Christmas tree was brought in. And there's a lot of controversy about Christmas trees around Christian. I read one story where some people believe that the first Christmas tree was introduced by Martin Luther himself. That he brought one because he had been outside looking at the skies and worshiping God. And he was looking through a tree as the stars fly, come through it. It was such a beautiful image to him. He brought the tree in and put lights on it. You know, that's one thing I read on the Christmas tree. But all these things, they're things we think about when we think of Christmas. But what, let me ask you, what is the real meaning of Luke 2.10 here? If you go back, Luke 2.10 says, Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of joy, which will be to all people. What's the real meaning of that? <clears throat> What's God mean there? You know tidings? He says, I bring you good tidings. Tidings and gospel are derived from the same Greek word. And the word is euangelizo. It means the good news. 
tidings and gospel are, are derived from that same word. So what essentially that angel is saying, he said, I'm bringing you the gospel. I'm bringing you the good news. Jesus Christ is born this day in Bethlehem. I'm bringing the good news of Jesus Christ. A Savior has come to save their people. Not save them from the Roman oppression. Not save them from the Pharisees that have started to crush down people with their religious ways. He come to save us from our own selves. From our own sin. Jesus Christ come to save us. That was the message of the angels. They brought the gospel. Gospel. And the message of the gospel is that humanity is no longer an enemy with the Almighty. We can have peace with God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's Son tore down those barriers that we, we experienced. God's Son <coughs> tore down any barriers there are between us and God. Between us and Him. He made that bridge. He made that way. He became... <coughs> Jesus come, took the hand of God, and he took the hand of humanity, and he brought us together. And it's through him and him only that we can find that way, that we have that way. And Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There is no condemnation. Condemnation is the Greek word katakrima, and it means an adverse sentence. An adverse sentence. So there is no adverse sentence to those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ Jesus, you have assurance of salvation. Now let me clear something up there now. He didn't say if you are in church, you have assurance of salvation. He didn't say if you're in a Bible study, you have assurance of salvation. He didn't say if you're involved in community projects, that if you're a good person, that if you've done more good than you have bad, that you have assurance of salvation. He said if you are in Christ Jesus, there is no adverse sentence. That you have assurance of your salvation if you are in Christ Jesus. No other way but through Jesus. Not through anything you did, but through Jesus. This is what Christmas is all about. This is what Christmas boils down to. We think of Christmas trees and polar bears and just all kinds of you know, reindeer, Santa Claus we think of all this stuff but what it boils down to is that right there, that's what Christmas is all about, the cross <coughs> Billy Graham said for Christmas to have a meaning it cannot be separated from the cross for Christmas to have a meaning it cannot be separated from the cross those words just rang so true when I read that <coughs> Christmas to have a meaning. It cannot be separated from the cross. Paul tells us there's no, there's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Then he goes on to say, who do not work, walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 26 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. As Christians, we should exhibit those things we find in verse 23. We should, people come in there and they should experience love, joy, and peace from us. They should say that there is definitely love, joy, and peace with these people. They have something that I don't want. You ever met that kind of person? They have something I do want, rather. Have we ever, have you ever met one of those people? I, I remember that old Pentecostal preacher up there in Bonfie, John Chance. Thank the world of him. He always had something that I knew I wanted. He had a peace about him. And I said, man, I, there's something there that I know I'd love to have. And I found out later what it was. It was that peace that only comes from God. People ought to experience that when they're around us. They should experience that love, joy, and peace. We shouldn't be going around with the mother girls. We shouldn't go around with a frown, you know. We ought to be the happiest people here on earth, especially this time of year. We're celebrating the cross of Calvary. We're celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ who come to this world <coughs> with the sole purpose of going to that cross to pay a price he didn't know. We ought to be... 
you know, love, joy, and peace ought to be part of our long suffering. It means patience. We ought to be patient. Patient with one another. Patient with God. Patient with everything. <coughs> You're not rushing everything. Not getting out of God's timing. Kindness, goodness. Yeah, those ought to go without saying. But Paul had to put them in there because he knows how we are. He knows we're not always kind. He knows we're not always good to each other. But he says those are the fruit of the Spirit. We're to be kind to each other. We're to be good to each other. We're to be kind to the folks out in the world. We're to be good to them. Faithfulness. We're to be faithful. We're to be faithful. We're to be faithful in all things. We're to be faithful in our finances and our marriages. We're to be faithful with our church families. We're to be faithful with God. <coughs> he, he expects faithfulness out of us. Gentleness. Be gentle with each other. Self-control. To, to, to have that self-control. There's times that I want to grab somebody and choke them. You know? That, I really have to watch this with my kids. I'm getting better about it. Because that... Sarah, I love Sarah. You know, I got that special bond with my daughter. And I know she hates being a sermon illustration, but I have a special bond with my daughter, and I love her with a way I couldn't experience. But she knows, she knows how to push every button I have. She just knows how to push my buttons. And there's times I want to grab her up and just shake her. You know, but sometimes we have to <laughs> exercise that self-control. Verse 24 and 25, he says, And those who, are in, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Victory comes through surrender to Christ, not self-effort. <coughs> Victory comes from surrender to Christ, not self-effort. Maybe we need to examine our motives every now and then. Maybe we ought to take a good look at ourselves. We talked about this some in Sunday school this morning. We got to take a good look at our motive. What's behind what we're doing? Are we doing what we're doing to glorify ourselves? To get a pat on the back from somebody else? Are we doing the things we do? Do, do we come here and do the things we do at the church so that somebody will take notice of us, somebody will pat us on the back? Or do we do it because we want to glorify God through it? Do we do it because we want... We want God to be glorified. If you're doing it because you're looking for accolades from somebody, you're doing it for the wrong reason. We need to examine our motives. Victory comes through surrender to Christ. We're to surrender to Jesus Christ. It's not our own self-effort. Our works, the things we do, are not going to get us into heaven. If you believe that, you're on a path to hell. It's through Jesus, Jesus Christ, and the cross of Calvary that you'll get into heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It wasn't me that said it. It wasn't the Apostle Paul that said it. It was Jesus Christ himself that said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. But you've got churches full of people that are trying to work their way into heaven. That are trying to add something to what God has already put there. And they... <clears throat> And then they tell me, well, God's grace ain't good enough. It upsets me. I'm going to tell you something. I believe in a work salvation. I believe in a work salvation. The only problem is I don't believe it's my works. I believe it's the works of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. I can get fired up over that. I just... I believe in God's grace. I believe God done what needed to be done, and there's nothing I can add to it. My job is to be obedient and to glorify God through that. Verse 26. Right there he says, let us, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Walking in the Spirit leads to helpfulness and service, not to provoking one another. Walking in the Spirit leads to helpfulness and service, not provoking one another. So if we're walking in the Spirit, we're going to be helping one another. We're going to be serving one another. We're going to be washing one another's feet, so, and, so to speak. Maybe we need to have a foot washing service here one day to have a good humbling time. Cheryl's sitting there thinking, I ain't washing your feet. <laughs> you can find me somebody else to wash. I ain't washing your feet. <laughs> but that's what walking in the Spirit leads to 
It's servitude. It, it leads to helpfulness. You know, we want to be obedient. We want to serve others. It, it, it becomes, it gets you to the point where you realize it's not all about me. It's about Him. It's about serving Him. It's about glorifying Jesus. It doesn't lead to pride or conceit. Conceit. You ever met a, a prideful Christian? A conceited Christian? I've met them. And man, they just turn me away. They just make me want to run. They're better than you. They're holier than you. They've got it figured out. They're not broken. They're not undone. They're not sinners. I've heard preachers stand up there and say, I got saved and I haven't sinned since. And I'm sitting there thinking, you just lied to me. That's a sin. Because the Bible says if you, if you say you've not sinned, you're a liar. And the truth is not with you. Let me tell y'all something. You can't walk the Christian walk. Can't none of us walk this Christian walk. We can't walk it out perfectly. But if we'll let the Christ that lives in us, if we'll let the Spirit of God that dwells within us walk this thing out, it can be done. If you're trying to walk this thing out in the flesh, if you're trying to do it yourself, if you're trying to get accolades for you, make yourself look good, you'll never walk this Christian walk. You might talk the church talk. You might convince a lot of people of a lot of things. You'll never walk this Christian walk out. God made all this possible through the sacrifice of His Son. God made every bit of this possible through the sacrifice of His Son. See, that baby in the manger was born with the purpose of going to that cross. We think of a sweet little baby in the manger. <coughs> And we think, how cute, you know, and all that. We don't think of that image that Michael showed us at the first of the, at the, first of the service. But that's exactly what that baby in that cradle, that sweet little innocent baby, come here for. And you might say, well, that was a gruesome image. You maybe, that, maybe that was a, you thought it was a little too much or whatever. But that's the reality of the manger. Jesus Christ come here to do that, to go to that cross, and He come here to do it for me and you. He come here to pray, pay a price He didn't have to pay. He paid the price that me and you owed. You know, my brother, he had just got saved. And he said, we were doing a little home Bible study, and he said something that just stuck with me. He said, you know, I come to the point where I realized he said, if, if my bank called me up and said, look, your house payment has been forgiven. You don't owe another dime. The, the, the slate's wiped clear. You don't owe us nothing. He said, I'm going to be out there telling people about it. He said, I'm going to tell people to go bank with my bank. My bank's the greatest bank because they wiped my debt claim. They just took everything I owed and put it to the side. Didn't have to, but they did. He said, Jesus did the same thing for me. He said, he took my debt and he just put it to the side. He said, I want everybody to bank with Jesus. He said, I want to tell everybody that their debt can be paid if they'll just put their trust with him, if they'll put everything they got with him. That's what Jesus came to the manger for. I know this ain't your typical Christian you got a Christmas message. But the manger has so much to do with the cross that it gets overshadowed. Jesus was born just to die. And he was born just to die for me and you. I got a story here. I'm going to close with this story. And I want y'all to listen close to this story. There was once a bridge which spanned a larger river. During most of the day, the bridge sat with its length, running up and down the river parallel with the banks, allowing ships to pass through freely on both sides of the bridge. But at certain times each day, 
a train would come along and the bridge would be turned sideways across the river, allowing a train to cross it. A switchman sat in a shack on one side of the river where he operated the controls to turn the bridge and lock it into place as the train crossed. One evening, as the switchman was waiting for the last train of the day to come, he looked off into the distance through the dimming twilight and caught sight of the train lights. He stepped onto the control and waited until the train was within, the, within a prescribed distance when he was about to turn the bridge. He turned the bridge in, into position, but to his horror, he found the locking control did not work. If the bridge was not securely in position, it would wobble back and forth at the ends when the train came onto it, causing the train to jump the track and go crashing into the river. This would be a passenger train with many people aboard. He left the bridge, turned across the river, and hurried across the bridge to the other side of the river where there was a lever switch he could hold to operate the lock manually. He would have to hold the lock back, back firmly as the train crossed. He could hear the rumble of the train now, and he took hold of the lever and leaned backward to apply his weight into it, locking the bridge. He kept applying the pressure to keep the mechanism locked. Many lives depended on this man's strength. Then, coming across the bridge from the direction of his control shack, he heard a sound that made his blood run cold. Daddy, where are you? His four-year-old son was crossing the bridge to look for him. His first impulse was to cry out to the child, run, run. But the train was too close. His tiny legs would never make it across the bridge in time. The man almost left his lever to run and snatch up his son and carry him to safety. But he realized that he could not get back to the lever. Either the people on the train or his little son must die. He took a moment to make his decision. <coughs> the train sped safely and swiftly on its way, and no one aboard was even aware of the tiny, tiny broken body thrown mercilessly into the river by the onrushing train. Nor were they aware of the pitiful figure of the sobbing man still clinging tightly to the locking lever long after the train had passed. They did not see him walking home more slowly than he had ever walked to tell his wife how their son had brutally died. Now if you comprehend the emotions which went through this man's heart, you can begin to understand the feelings of our Father in Heaven when he sacrificed his son to bridge the gap between us and eternal life. Can there be any wonder that he caused the earth to tremble and the skies to darken when his son died? How does he feel when we speed along through life without giving a thought to what was done for us through Christ Jesus? When was the last time you thanked him for the sacrifice of his son? If you're a parent, you can relate to that story right there. Can you imagine that train operator, that, that, that bridge operator, the emotions? And then he says, imagine the emotions of God. I never thought until I read this story about that. The earth trembling, the skies darkening. God didn't have to do what he'd done. He could have let us just run on through life on a crash course with hell. But he intervened. He intervened in such a way. He sent his son Jesus to pay a price we did not owe. Little baby born in a manger. 33 and a half years later would end up on a Roman cross. When was the last time you thanked God for the sacrifice of his son? Mr. Neal comes up and plays today. I want you to give us a thought. And I want to ask you, have you ever truly accepted that gift? See, it wasn't only a sacrifice, it was a gift. It was God's gift to humanity. God made a way. God said, I don't want anybody to perish. I want everybody to have a way. I don't want you to have to go to heaven. <coughs> but he left the choice up to us. He said, here's the gift. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to accept my gift? If you've never accepted the gift, I invite you today to come forward. God's got a Christmas gift. Right now. The very first Christmas gift is still available. Best, better than any Black Friday deal you'll ever get. You don't even have to wait in line. God's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. If you want to come up today, you feel it on your heart that you need to be up here and thank God for the sacrifice of His Son.
God's drawing you to be at these altars, you come to these altars today, whatever it might be.